Okay, welcome. Um, so this is set for anybody who has any questions and we're going to sort of treat this like nobody knows anything. So for those of you who do use Regen Medicine in your practice, um, please uh, be patient with us because I, I don't wanna make any assumptions. Um, we're just gonna talk more about how orthobiologics and regenerative medicine can help in orthopedics and musculoskeletal medicine. Let's see. So just as a disclosure, I don't have any relationships financially or indirectly or indirectly with anything that we're gonna be discussing. So the goals are gonna to be to understand really what constitutes an orthobiologic, the types of orthobiologics. When we say orthobiologics, what are we even talking about and how, how are they harvested? Um, common misconceptions, both with patients and people who are doing this. And also we're gonna end with some musculoskeletal conditions that are actually appropriate to consider treating with orthobiologic therapies. So when we say orthobiologics or regenerative medicine, what does that really mean? Uh, a good way to think about it is regenerative medicine is replacing or regenerating human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or reestablish normal function. It kind of implies that you had function, you lost function, and we would like to, we would like to obtain it again. So when we talk about orthobiologics, it's more of a subspecialty of regenerative medicine. So it's more, how do we help your muscles, your tendons, your bones? How do we help your skeleton move better? It's more of a branch within. So of course, regenerative medicine, um, a lot of different branches are working on that. Specifically with athletes, so when you're dealing with anybody who um, has to be tested, and a lot of them worry about popping positive um, unintentionally. So for those of you that work with athletes that are tested, you know that they can be tested anytime, and they're aware of that, and that they're aware that the burden of proof relies on them. So they, they can never say, oh, I didn't realize what I was doing or what I was taking actually was banned. That's not an option. So the WADA has a statement on platelet-derived preparations, platelet-derived plasma, and stem cells. So for PRP, they're not prohibited. Um, there is some evidence of growth factors and the stimulation of growth factors, but um, because they were removed, they have been removed from WADA as a banned substance. Um, they really say that they've the studies don't demonstrate an actual performance enhancement, which is the key um, beyond any potential therapeutic effect. So they do say that there are growth factors. So platelet-rich plasma is not, uh, is not banned, but there are specific growth factors that are. So you have to be careful with that. And then stem cell treatments, and we're going to get more into should you even use that term, or if you use it, should you qualify it? But they do actually address stem cells and say that and non-transformed stem cells, when they're used alone and you don't try to grow them with any growth factor or hormone, that's also okay as long as they return the functioning of the affected area to normal and you're not trying to enhance it better than it was before. Now in the US, that's not a problem because we're not allowed, we, we work under the auspices of minimal manipulation for any stem cells, if we're gonna use that word. Uh, so. For us in the U.S., that doesn't tend to be an issue, but that's something if you're dealing with any international athletes that you need to be able to advise them on. So when we talk about orthobiologics, these are all phrases that your athletes or your patients um, might be asking about. So prolotherapy, that one's been around longer than I've been in medicine. We're going to start talking about that one. PRP, that's platelet-rich plasma. That's when we draw the blood off of a peripheral vein and then we spin it down. We're going to go into how that works. Alpha-2 macroglobulin injections, platelet lysate, all of these are different ways to extract possible potential cells from your body and put them in an area that they could do the most good. So today we're going to talk about prolotherapy, we're going to talk about platelet-rich plasma, we're going to talk about BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate or injectate, BMAI, and microfragmented adipose. So that's ASCs, lipogem. They also, we're kind of moving away from ASCs because that's an older term. ASC stands for adipose derived stem cells and we are trying to move away from the stem cell term. So we're actually calling it now um, MFAT and micronized, we'll go into that. So it's just a little bit more um, PC and trying to be more accurate in how we're describing things so that patients are not misled. And lastly, there are perinatal tissue products that people are doing in the U.S. 
I personally am not doing any of them. Um, we'll go into that in a little bit, but amniotic tissue, umbilical cord blood, Wharton's jelly. In the United States, for those to be approved, they have to have been cleaned so many times that every study that is done demonstrate there are no live cells in those. So there is interesting, there's an interesting use around it, but for my practice in orthopedics, I um, am still pretty leery of it, especially since we're not giving any live cells. So I personally don't do any of that just yet. So prolotherapy, um, Brody, Bode Miller, he cracks me up. So this interview was in 2006 in ESPN Mag magazine. So I don't know about you guys, but when we talk about regenerative medicine, we kind of think it's newer in the last 10 or 15 years, but prolotherapy has been around forever. And it's just where you inject an irritant substance. And in this case, prolotherapy is dextrose. So it's like kind of like glucose, but a slightly different chemical makeup into an area to promote the growth of new tissue. Uh, so in 2006, Bodhi said, I wouldn't be skiing now if it weren't for prolotherapy. And then he won the gold medal in 2010. So there was something to be said about that then. So when I talk about the proposed me mechanism of action, this is kind of where we as medical people have to be humbled. We think we know how things are how things are working in the body, but we're more theorizing. So we're more kind of observing and then connecting the dots, but we're not, we don't always say this has to happen because of this. So when I say proposed, there is a bit of assumption. So join me in this journey of why we think prolotherapy works. So it's an injected solution. So it's hyperosmolar. So it actually causes a hypertonic atmosphere. It causes um, the body's like, this is not right. So the cells that you are, that are near actually rupture because they try to correct that um, osmolarity. And then that, that, that cell rupture, your body recognizes as an injury. So then it, it sends um, the platelet-derived growth factors that are going around your body. Like in your blood, you have growth factors just hanging out, ready to pounce. And so it upregulates those, and then that stimulates the healing cascade. And when I say it stimulates the healing cascade, when we think about um, inflammation in the body. We used to think inflammation is bad, it's injury, we have to stop it as soon as it happens. We have to shut it down so that your body is okay. And what we now know is that inflammation is how your body actually signals the rest of the body that there's an injury. Think of it as a circle. So if you, if you start here and you have an injury and something happens, you, your body actually has to signal it so that your body can send the stuff to fix it so that it can actually fix it and then get back to normal. If at any time you break down this, this circle, then you end up with chronic inflammation or incomplete healing. And that's what we're trying to change or intervene or actually maybe fake the body out a little bit and say, you have a new injury. Let's control this injury so that you can heal correctly this time. So that's what I mean by the stimulation of the healing cascade. It's almost uh, the same as start just restarting the inflammatory cascade. Um, there is, when, and if ever we put a needle into the body, there's also an effect. So we can't just say it's what the needle is injecting, but the needle itself interrupting some cells can have an effect as well as prolotherapy reduces neurogenic inflammation, meaning it's really good for nerve irritation. And we'll talk more about that. So for best uses, when we think about the tissues in the body that we might be able to intervene with, we think about bone, like your skeleton. We think about entheses. So that's, an enthesis is where a tendon connects to a bone. So you have a muscle, you have a tendon, and then you have a bone, and the tendon is connecting the muscle to that bone. So it's, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's like a passive tissue. So that tendon that connects to the bone is just being pulled by the muscle. And that's an enthesis where it connects. Like, like Osgood Schlatter, that's the one where people get bumps on the front of their knee. Um, tendons, like rotator cuff undersurface tears. Um, the ligament, the Achilles can do well with this. Muscles, not so, not so much. Um, joint and cartilage, intraarticular, it can really calm things down. Um, and this is where I like prolotherapy the most is perineural. So by perineural, like nerves live in a sheath. They kind of travel through your body in a protective sheath. And so you can actually, under ultrasound guidance, you can find that between that little cellular la layer between the, the nerves that are coursing through and the sheath that's around it. And if you can get right in, then you can actually hydro dissect you can inject fluid and it'll travel along and around that needle to try to lift up any adhesions that have developed 
You can also do it just subcutaneously. That's called the lift dog technique, which um, LYFT. So that's where you just sort of try to disrupt all of the subcutaneous, the very tiny nerves you can't even see with the naked eye. So prolotherapy has some limitations. It's, it's usually not one and done. It usually takes a few injections monthly for four to six months or longer. So this is not a fast game. Most of Regen Med isn't. It's also very hard to get a hold of because it's not expensive to buy and so it's not expensive to make. So manufacturers aren't very interested in it. It does have few adverse effects, so that's an advantage, and it is cheap if you can get your hands on it. Let's talk about platelet-rich plasma. So anytime you see PRP, we're gonna, this means platelet-rich plasma. So that is where the, you, the patient brings everything that they need with you. So they actually, you just draw the blood off of their arm, 30 to 60 milliliters. So it's not a small amount, but it is um, an amount that's pretty typical in terms of when you're getting your blood checked. And then we separate the platelets. If you can see my, um, if you can see my arrow, you can see here we actually put it in a centrifuge, so it spins really fast. So the heavier things fall to the bottom, the lighter things stay at the top, and then you get this, you get these layers. So depending on how much blood you um, spin and how long you spin it and how strongly you spin it, that changes um, what you're going to get with the layers here and you extract the platelet-rich part of those layers, and it's usually about three to six uh, milliliters, and then you can inject that injured area, or the area that you want to find, um, with these concentrated platelets. So when you inject concentrated platelets, the idea is we increase the growth factors up to eight times, which promotes temporary relief and stops the inflammation. So the idea is, so autologous means you give it to yourself. So you, um, you draw your own blood in a small volume and it actually is increased from the baseline. So the platelets in a normal injury, they're the first to arrive. So essentially we're re-injuring the body and we're deciding how it gets injured. We're putting it where we want it and, it's go and we're trying to direct the action. So let's say somebody comes in and they had a partial tear to their rotator cuff or let's say they have a partial tear to their um, extensor mechanism of their shoulder. And this happened a long time ago, years ago, decades ago. And that would tell us that the inflammatory cascade from the original injury has resolved. Your body doesn't know that there's still an injury. So we have to sort of restart that entire process. So we can put the platelets right there. And what we're putting in, what the growth factors that are secreted by these platelets are platelet-derived growth factors, transforming growth factors, vascular endothelial growth factors, and epithelial growth factors. Those inhibit the healing cascade, that they kind of continue along that inflammatory circle that we talked about to get to the healing. When you notice um, the vascular endothelial growth factor and the epithelial growth factor, so what happens is your body actually needs to get all the good stuff to that area so we can watch for neovascularity, new small blood vessels coming to that area. That's a good indication that there's an adequate response. So what's the mechanism of action? So these are all those words I just said, the platelet-derived growth factor. The GF just means growth factor. Growth factor is good for us. That leads to angiogenesis. That's that new blood vessel formation that I was talking about. Proliferation, that's the tissues uh, responding. Chemotaxis, it's calling more stuff to it. Differentiation, which is when um, it, it um, matures. And there's actually an anti-inflammatory action. So it's like it kind of is self-limiting. This is a wound healing model, but this is, I like to explain this because it goes in days and we talk about the inflammatory cascade as being a, about 14 days. So this latent phase is the initial inflammatory cascade. That's the initial injury. And then you end up getting a proliferative phase and then the repair phase starts at about day four. It peaks between the first and second weeks and it's still going at week three. So we know that these things take time. So when people say, I injured myself on a Saturday, can I play the game on Monday? There's not enough time, so we have to work through that. Okay, so this is something that I really wanted to take the time to go over. A lot of people have heard about PRP, but they don't know that there are different types of PRP. And it's very important because one thing that we're trying to do is make sure that we're using the right 
intervention for the right diagnosis. And all the time I have patients come in who've had PRP somewhere else and they want to get my opinion on getting more PRP or should they do something for a new body part? And I ask them, what type of PRP did you have? And frequently they don't know. They just say, oh, I had PRP. And I say, is it leukocyte rich? Was it leukocyte poor? Was it PPP? And like platelet poor plasma instead of the platelet rich plasma? And unfortunately, they don't know the answer. And I think that's a missed opportunity because I think the patients should know why we're making a specific decision. And they should know that we are being, we're not just throwing the same thing at everybody. That's when things don't work. We can't just have a cookie cutter Plinko thing. You put the, you put the chip at the top and it's just going to go where it goes and we don't have to make any decisions. We have to guide every single step in order to control the injury so we can control the healing so that we can actually get this to resolve and then you don't need any more injections. So for leukocyte poor platelet-rich plasma, the, so leukocytes are um, the white blood cells there um, in this autologous condition plasma. You can also be platelet poor. So we think about leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor and platelet rich and platelet poor. And I'm going to go through that with you because there's different indications. So we talked about how when we draw the blood and we spin it down, you end up with these layers right here. So the buffy coat, this spot in the middle, it kind of has a little bit of everything. Let's see, I'm going to move the image of me so that you can see. Yes, so you can see here. This is, we're not interested in this plasma. We're interested in here. This is where there's the most potent younger platelets. There's mononuclear cells, there's neutrophils, there's red blood cells, there's plasma, there's platelets. It's kind of a, all the good stuff. There is some stuff that we don't quite want yet sometimes, but this is leukocyte-rich, platelet-rich plasma. Okay. Now, you can also get platelet-rich and leukocyte-poor. So this is a double spin method. Now, in order to do a double spin, you have to get more blood. So you have to start with enough to kind of bring it all down. With the double spin method, we start with this leukocyte rich. So we start with this here, and then we draw off this buffy coat that's in the middle, this little gray line, and we put it in its own vial. That buffy coat, like we said, it has white blood cells, it has neutrophils, it has monocytes, red blood cells, plasma, and platelets. Good stuff. The second spin reduces the white blood cells and the red blood cells dramatically. That's for very specific um, for very specific tissues. So you can have that higher platelet count, which we know the platelets can be helpful, but the leukocytes and the, and the red blood cells can be um, removed because we know that in particular um, tissues like cartilage, red blood cell products are actually chondrotoxic. That's why when people have like a big, um, we used to not touch hemarthrosis because we were like, oh, it's just going to keep bleeding. Now we know get that blood off of the cartilage because it's it's bad, it actually causes that, it destroys the cartilage and it causes it to wear down faster. So we wanna minimize those, um, those uh, insulting ingredients like the red blood cells. So the best uses for platelet-rich plasma are a lot of tendons, so partial UCL tears. That's the one that when you have pictures, they keep, they keep stressing this ligament and so eventually it kind of either partially tears or stretches or they can have a full tear. When they replace that, you guys have probably heard that that's Tommy John surgery. So partial UCL tears can do well with this. Lateral epicondylopathy, that's um, tennis elbow. Gluteus medius tendinopathy, that's that side of the hip pain that people get. They sometimes call it greater trochanteric bursitis. So now we know that that's interrelated with the tendons that are connecting underneath it. Plantar fasciitis is great for platelet rich plasma. And Knee osteoarthritis, but knee osteoarthritis, very specifically, we have to, it's mild and moderate, not severe, and we really want to make sure there's no, um, there's no red blood cells in that. So we really want to do the platelet, um, the, the, that second spin. 
There's some moderate quality evidence for patellar tendinopathy and Achilles tendinopathy. And I will tell you in my practice, I do them. Um, I find that it, they scar down quite nicely and there's um, some good remodeling and it really helps with the strength of the tissue, particularly because patellar and Achilles tendinopathy can be associated with bone spurs that have kind of cut them down. Um, so it helps when I, when I need to take out that bone spur with another mes method, the, if I help that tendon heal first, it's less likely to tear when I take out that bone spur. So sometimes I'll do staged procedures like that. So when we talk about the types of PRP, these are the things I wish that um, patients had conversations with their uh, physicians that are doing these procedures. So for tendons, I like leukocyte rich platelet rich plasma or leukocyte poor depending on how the tendon looks and if it's a tension tendon that sort of thing. For cartilage, you really want to do leukocyte poor platelet rich plasma. We talked about avoiding red blood cells but neutrophils also we try to avoid. And for muscles, so there, there are people that do platelet-rich plasma into muscles, and we're going to go into that in more detail with some studies, leukocyte-poor, platelet-poor plasma. But with muscles, um, so sometimes we talk about doing this early in an injury to kind of take advantage of inflammation. A lot of times the best time to do this is after the patient has demonstrated that they're not going to injure and then they're, I'm sorry, they're not going to heal after an injury. And then we need to step in. We know that we need to help out with muscles even more. So um, the studies are not showing that you should jump in, in the acute uh, injury, but in chronic injuries, there is a place. So we can talk, we'll talk about that later. Okay. So when it comes to platelet-rich plasma, the limitations are timeline and expense. So timeline, this is not fast. So there are accelerated timelines for our professional athletes, but we still can't, we can't rush everything in the human body. So uh, there is a timeline that has to be respected. And the expense insurance tends to not pay for it. Some insurances are covering it, but for the most part, they aren't. So there is an expense that's out of pocket for that. The advantages to platelet-rich plasma is that it can just be done in clinic. Like I said, the patient brings the blood with them in their arm, and we can, we can um, tailor the concentrations depending on the type of injury, the tissue, degeneration, tears, that sort of thing. Leukocyte-rich versus poor, platelet-rich, platelet-poor. So now you know all of those terms and you can um, have that conversation. Okay, BMAC and MFAT, what they are. So remember I said the um, terms are changing all the time. So when I gave this talk a year ago, this was not MFAT, I was calling it ASCs, adipose derived stem cells and having to um, say that doesn't exist anymore because we try not to say stem cells. So we have, we have been changing that. So now it's MFAT, microfragmented adipose tissue. Bone marrow concentrate is the other one. I want to talk about them in conjunction and then we'll talk about them differently, but these are the two other things we're going to spend time on today. So bone marrow concentrate is when we go into the uh, bone, usually like the iliac crest, as you can see here in the patient, and we suck up some of the bone marrow. You know, bone marrow is very fatty. Um, we concentrate it and then we apply it to the injury. Remember, in the United States, we are not allowed to do very much in terms of manipulation, minimal manipulation. So usually this is ready pretty quickly. The microfragmented adipose tissue or the MFAT, what we do is that's, uh, we pretty much do liposuction. We suck up those cells. So you have to have enough fat to donate. So some of our elite athletes don't have enough um, fat to do the MFAT. We have to do the bone marrow concentrate. So we actually um, put that, we, so this is what I suck up from the um, fat. I put it through this here, and then we run saline through it. It helps isolate the repair cells, and then it discards the unwanted material. This is the bare minimum of manipulation, and it still um, complies with the FDA. Again, this is how we think it happens. So when we do these, it, it brings the cells, it gives a signal to the sites of this degenerative or missing cartilage, missing cells in the subchondral bone. And the idea is that it repopulates the stem and progenitor cell pools on the surface of damaged cartilage. Now, keep in mind, we're not injecting the stem and progenitor cell pools. We are just putting in these, pre, these um, like precursors to those, and then it, it 
signals the body to bring its own already existing stem and progenitor cells. And then that modulates the joint. It actually changes the environment of this joint, of this damaged cartilage, either by secretion of the soluble factors or through cell to cell signaling. And this is key, so secretion. So a lot of times patients want a procedure that's going to fix it so that they never have to deal with it again. Particularly with BMAC and MFAT, they can be super um, interesting in arthritis, but what we know about arthritis is that it is, uh, it's a disease that is going to be progressive. So we can try to, I would say, we can try to stop the car from rolling downhill, but really our best chance is to slow it down as much as possible. And there are many things we can do to intervene with that. But with this, even if it's effective, we know that it's not effective forever. So if this is helpful, it's repeated six months, a year. Um, we try to stay on top of it and let it build on itself. But even in the most successful, we know, you know the studies are showing about 52 weeks they're following them out. So making sure patients understand that the realistic expectation is this doesn't fix anything, it can slow things down is important. And again, this, so this slide says BMAC ASCs, but it's really MFAT now. Um, the trophic effects, so there, it actually creates all of these um, healthy cells to come that are genetically wired for it. So MSCs, multipotent, um, I'm going to, mesenchymal cells, they stay at the injury site for a short time. That's all it does. But the therapeutic outcomes are not because of what we inject. Well, they are because of what we inject, but they, they just draw the actual important cells to this. Uh, let me sort of mention this a little bit. So BMAC, so the bone marrow aspirate concentrate, it's best for fracture, like a non-union. Um, femoral head avascular necrosis, pre-collapse when you still have the, um, the head. I mean, how many patients do we know that we don't know if it's a stress reaction versus an early AVN? This is a great option to save them from surgery. Um, rotator cuff tendon partial tears do well with BMAC. And knee osteoarthritis, both in the fluid and the synovium. We talk about the biologic reaction, but it's important to tell patients we're not repairing the cartilage. Right now, we are not, we are not reproducing the cartilage. We're not regenerating it. So this MFAT, or the liposuction that we do, it's great for knee arthritis as well. Achilles intersubstance defects uh, can be really effective for this. Meniscus tears, either acute or degenerative, can be great with this. And interestingly, glenohumeral joint with osteoarthritis and rotator cuff tendinopathies, because you know they tend to go hand in hand because the rotator cuff gets um, kind of these undersurface tears from the arthritis of the glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket joint. They tend to go hand in hand, so MFAC can be a really great way to hit both of those. So the limitations to BMAC and MFAT, um, it is a procedure. I, I can't just draw it off of your arm like you're giving blood. It has to be done in a surgery center. It is the most invasive. So um, the site that I have to harvest this from can be sore. Um, bone marrow, this decreases with age, the potential. Every age is different though. So are you a young 70 or an old 50? It changes. And the adipose tissue requires some level of processing. So we have to be very careful with how much we process the adipose tissue in the US because we want to um, be in compliance with the FDA, but we can only do that minimal manipulation. And then I tend to, um, BMAC and the MFAT, I, uh, they're very similar because you're, you're, brought, you're taking off these um, pluripotent cells, um, but they play this, this um, role there, you put them in and they don't have to interact with the cell you want it to, they just bring the cells to that area. So they have this great um, signaling. Let's see. So there was this argument, we used to, you know, we used to say, well, um, the adipose contains so many more cells, so many more nucleated cells. Um, but what we find is that you have enough. So if you're young, you have enough in your bone marrow. So it becomes kind of, a, it becomes just your splitting hairs. So I do want to touch on stem cells. So I've mentioned it briefly. I try not to use the term stem cells with patients other than to tell them that I am not injecting stem cells. And so when a patient comes to me and they said, oh, I'm going to, I'll go to a, I went to a clinic. I, um, I'm going to get stem cells from, uh, from this umbilical cord that they're going to bring. And I, I have to explain to them that that is not happening. And sometimes it's not necessarily the physician that they saw's fault. Patients want 
to be able to get stem cells. Unfortunately, we originally thought we were doing stem cells when we started this. And because of that, we coined that term and we used it, but now we know that we're not actually injecting stem cells. And Arnold Kaplan, he spoke at um, the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine a few years ago. He's the one who coined this term, mesenchymal stem cells, and he regrets it because he truly believed when he found them 30 years ago that they were going to act like stem cells in the body. They could become anything. And now we know what they do in the lab is they can become anything. But with all of the studies that we've done, we actually have not been able to show that they are stem cells. So we have to relabel them. We have to change how we talk about them. We weren't necessarily being dishonest. We thought we were saying the right words, but now that we know more, we have to, we have to be accurate. So now he, he realizes that we have to keep the MSC label, but he, likes, he wants to call them medicinal signaling cells because that's what they do. They signal the body's own stem cells to come. Uh, so I'm, I always tell patients over and over, I am not injecting stem cells. Nobody is injecting stem cells in the United States that we know of. Um, and they will still leave and say, oh, Dr. Rubish is going to do some stem cells for me. So I do my best. I try to write it down. I try not to judge the other physicians when the patient says they're getting stem cells because I know sometimes they hear it. But if you're having a conversation with a physician, if you're having a conversation with a patient, make sure that they're using the right terms because informed consent and realistic expectations are really important. And this is a partnership and I want to make sure that patients understand what they're getting. So it's a misnomer. It's time to change the name. Okay, let's talk about how we can use this. So how do we use these? In, how is, what are some evidence-based medicine for and against? So um, mild and moderate NEOA, I think this is so exciting. How many times do we see patients that uh, have some knee pain, it's early, it's not nearly bad enough to need a joint replacement, but they know that there's some cartilage defect and they want to prevent it from getting worse. So this was a randomized controls trial comparing hyaluronic acid, visco supplementation, and platelet-rich plasma, and then the combination of both in the treatment of mild to moderate osteoarthritis of the knee. So um, hyaluronic acid is um, an injection that I do frequently for patients who have mild and moderate symptomatic knee osteoarthritis, and it can be helpful, and a lot of insurances pay for it. I do the series of three because it's uh, less invasive. Um, well, it's, it's three injections instead of one, but it's less inflammatory. So this was a prospective, randomized, controlled, double-blinded trial, and they compared PRP to hyaluronic acid or the visco supplementation, and PRP had lower VAS. That's um, that's like, you know, have you ever been in a doctor's office and you have to say my pain is zero to 10 with a line? There's no numbers. That's a VAS score. And then a higher Womax score, which is, um, which is uh, I actually don't even remember the <laughs> crossing, but it's a higher Womax score is a higher function. So, and then they actually compared them together, doing hyaluronic acid and platelet-rich plasma. And that actually was a significant decrease in pain and functional limitation. So hyaluronic acid to platelet-rich plasma beats hyaluronic acid alone, and, and it also beats platelet-rich plasma alone. So that was pretty, that's pretty exciting, because how can we help patients do more with the work that they're doing? I love this. Um, I love it when the study came out. By ankle sprains. So those of us that cover, um, that cover sports, we know that a uh, high ankle sprain is usually a season ender. So this was where um, the 16 studies with a high ankle sprain, uh, that's the AITFL, tear was randomized to play the rich plasma versus control and they the important thing is they were given the same return to play protocol so they weren't like the they weren't treated any differently between them and they came, they got back to return to play 20 days faster 30 percent faster 50 percent longer that's huge when we're talking about a three or four month season Chondromalacia. So that's when the cartilage is starting to wear away. This is again hyaluronic acid versus platelet-rich plasma. Now they did, and oh this was um, double-blinded. So that means neither the person doing the injection or the person that is getting the injection knows what they got. So you can't even like suggest to the person they're doing better if you think they should be because you don't know. So um, in platelet-rich plasma, there were significantly higher scores at 24 and 52 weeks. This is when I talked about how the studies are showing up to a year. 
52 weeks for the secondary characteristics. So um, the primary characteristics, that was the Womack pain score. That one was no difference. But the secondary characteristics and what they considered secondary were the patient's self-reported function. So the patient did not know what procedure they got, but they reported they were doing better, significantly better at 24 and 52 weeks. So at six months and almost a year. And another thing they did interesting with, with the study was they actually drew off the fluid from the knee to, to diagnose, do they have inflammatory markers, which we know is bad for the cartilage and helps kind of accelerate osteoarthritis. PRP, there was a decrease in those inflammatory markers. So that was pretty interesting. Um, core injury. When I say that, um, have you guys heard of athletic pubalgia or um, like a groin injury? So this was an interesting study. Um, this was five NFL players. So this is a common injury. Um, so when we think about athletic pubalgia, that's when the rectus femoris comes down at the bottom of the um, pubic bone, and then the adductor is coming like this. So when you're, when you're exploding off of the field, what happens is this is pulling this way, and this muscle is pulling this way. So often there's a tension. Let me get my hands right. There's a tension like this, and you can get a, a rip in the tendon between them. And that's called athletic pubalgia. So uh, what they did was they, they took five NFL players who had an acute injury and they put the PRP right where the injury was. And four developed heterotopic ossification. Heterotopic ossification is when bone forms in muscle and tendon. So that's not a good finding. And the fifth that did not develop heterotopic ossification still had extensive fibrosis, which is also not a good finding. So they do know that of the previous um, core in, acute core injuries, over a thousand of them, only two had developed heterotopic ossification. So this is when I was talking about it earlier in, this, in the talk. Um, this is not a good indication for platelet rich plasma or regenerative medicine. So there was almost too much inflammation and it got out of control. And so the body started to wall it off and it created um, bone. And bone in the bone that sits in tissue that is supposed to expand and contract is a problem. So we talked about the pitchers, um, the, over, any overhead athlete, the elbow UCL partial tear. So this is a, a great study. So 34 athletes with partial thickness UCL tear, um, leukocyte rich, that LR stands for leukocyte rich, and PRP is the platelet rich plasma. It was done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, I do all of my PRP and BMAC and um, MFAT under ultrasound guidance because I want to make sure I'm getting what I'm injecting into the defect that needs to be injected. So another thing for you to ask your patients or for patients to ask their physicians is how are you going to inject it? Are you going to do it uh, landmark guided, which means you're not going to use ultrasound? Are you going to use uh, fluoroscopy, which is a way to look at the bones and the joints? Or are you going to use an ultrasound, um, which I am biased but I like it because I can see all the soft tissue, I can see the blood vessels, I can see the fascia, I can see the nerves, I can see the bones. I can't see through the bones. That is a limitation, but I'm not injecting in the bones for that. So 88% were able to return to pre-injury activity, and the average return to play was 12 weeks uh, with um, a median 10 to 15 weeks. So that's a really good response. So if you have an orthobiologics consult with me, I. Um, it's usually I'm explaining to them why they're not yet a candidate for orthobiologics or regenerative medicine. So I review the diagnosis and imaging and um, we confirm the diagnosis. So sometimes patients think that they have one thing because they've been told it by someone who didn't actually do a true biomechanical assessment or they originally had an injury that healed and now they have compensatory behaviors and it's not what they were dealing with originally. So I have to make sure we have the correct diagnosis and we have the right imaging to be talking about what they think we're talking about. I'll do a good physical exam and I'll do a biomechanical assessment. And the reason why I do that is because if we don't address the reason that they tore, they're gonna tear again. If I didn't address the biomechanics that led them to break, they're going to break again. So if I can get them to heal and then they go back to the uncorrected formula, they're, it's gonna be an unsuccessful procedure because we didn't change what they were doing. Um, we try to discuss the prior treatment. I want to make sure that everything should have been done. This is why 
um, I try to make sure they understand that they need to have done their biomechanical optimization with physical therapy. They might have needed to do massage therapy to decrease the tension on that tendon. Um, they need to uh, have addressed all of those before we'll do it. And then we talk about the standard of care. So what do people who don't do regenerative medicine or um, orthobiologics do? Corticosteroid injections. I use those. I just had a conversation with a patient today about when I would do a corticosteroid injection versus a platelet-rich plasma injection on his shoulder. And I sent him back to his physical therapist for four weeks so that we can talk about it. Um, visco supplementation, that's the hyaluronic acid. Oral medications, topical medications, continued physical therapy, bracing, surgery, we don't have to do anything. These are all options. So a lot of times patients feel um, a pressure. They feel like if they don't make a decision now, it's not a good option. Like they, they'll lose that option. And I try to um, take that uh, take that urgency away. Um, I would much prefer that they have a good idea of what they want to do and why they're doing it, and then they can always come back. There's, I want them to know um, the evidence behind it, and then they need to think about it. And I often, I often just have a long discussion with them, and a lot of this is dispelling the myths. So we have to talk about what they thought they were getting, what other people have told them that they were getting, and what I believe I can do for them honestly. Um, with that setting expectations. And then I usually want them to understand what the post-procedural protocol is because it is involved. And I explain to patients that when I inject you, I expect you to get worse for the first two weeks for that inflammatory proliferate until we get to that proliferative phase. And at, at two weeks, I hope that you're back to where you started. At three months, I should know how much you responded and that will tell us. And I bring them back at two weeks um, to make sure they're having an, an appropriate inflammatory response. And if they're not, then I bring them back in another two weeks. And we just, we're always um, seeing how their body is responding so that we know what we need to do with each person. So common misunderstandings. So this, if you don't see any slides, this is the slide I want you to remember. Just because I feel like every time I talk to a patient, I have to actually explain what I'm not doing before I explain what I can do. So the orthobiologic injections do not contain stem cells. Specifically, umbilical cord injections do not contain any live cells. No type of regenerative source is better than another because no injury is the same. So we have to tailor our, um, our recommendations based on that patient. Right now, we cannot regrow cartilage. That's where we were talking about with the osteoarthritis. So the loss of, of cartilage leads to arthritis. So I want to make sure patients understand we can try to slow down the loss of the cartilage, but we cannot regrow what you have lost. And sometimes multiple injections are required. So I don't know how they're going to respond. And I'm happy to go on this journey with them and we'll keep gathering data and I can know what I would recommend, but we don't know if one will be enough. And the recovery time ranges from days to weeks to months, depending on the treatment decision that we make. So what's next? I think orthobiologics, regenerative medicine is super promising, um, but we need to find the right label. I actually think regenerative medicine is a little misleading. Um, it's a very accepted term and patients understand it, but I just explained to you that we're, we regenerate some tissues, but not others. So I don't know if it's the most inclusive term. The Mayo Clinic suggested restorative. I think that's a great term, but restorative, I don't know. I also feel, I feel like a nap is restorative, so maybe that's not the best option for me. Um, and it's not the best option for anyone. It might be the best option for some people, especially the right patient. And I'm happy to discuss that with them, but I have to be honest with them that I won't just do it because they want it. I have to make sure that it's the right thing for them. And I feel it is too. Um, having the correct patient diagnosis and treatment is vital as well as their correct procedure. Treat the cause. So when patients come to see me and they're hoping for a quick fix, it's a difficult discussion when I have to reset their expectations, but I have to do the right thing and I'm not gonna overpromise something. And I think patients appreciate that, but sometimes it's a difficult first, uh, first conversation. So I'm happy to wade into that with them and let them know and let them leave and do their own research. And I'm, a lot of times patients appreciate that and sometimes it's hard to hear. Uh, part of the reason that the evidence-based medicine is lagging is that we have so many different standards between, even when I said, you know, platelet-rich plasma, is it leukocyte-rich? Is it leukocyte-poor? How poor is it? Um, and the goal is to proceed in responsible fashion. Okay, this is Kodiak. Anybody who's met me knows my dog. Um, he has, he's not sitting on my lap right now because he's not allowed, but um, he's my indication that it's time for questions.
So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Uh, so we have one question right now in the poll, and I have a couple that are emailed to me ahead of time. Um, first question is, what do you mean by manipulation when talking about BMAC or MFAT? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So um, when we talk about manipulation, we talk, there's, um, you can use different chemicals to try to strip it of certain things. And then you can also use certain growth factors to try to make it become more than it was when you extracted it, but before you, um, before you inject it. So um, if that's why one of the things you're not allowed to do is remove it from the premises in order to um, do certain things. So you have to inject it when you get it. That's something that we um, talk about. So a lot of the labs are in the next room from the procedure suites for that reason. But yeah, that's the minimal manipulation for now with the, and that's an FDA um, guideline. And uh, a couple of these questions coming up may have been answered in your common misunderstandings, but definitely want to review them again. Yeah, let's make sure we address them. Does prolotherapy strengthen the tendons? Um, so I think of it as yes. So um, let's talk about tendonitis and tendinosis. So tendonitis is acute inflammation of a tendon. Um, and if you think about a tendon as uh, like a bunch of fibers all kind of just going in the same row. When you have tendonitis, it's an acute irritation and then the tendons kind of like come back together. Tendonitis is, or tendinosis is kind of chronic tendonitis. So it's inflammation on top of inflammation on top of inflammation and then you get degeneration. So a degenerated tendon, a tendinotic tendon is not as strong. So what prolotherapy and any of these kind of regenerative things we were talking about, the goal is to send in those signaling cells so that the healing process can occur and it causes almost like a D, uh, first um, uh, less strengthening, like a destabilization of the structure. Think of it as like a house fire. Like they have to clear all out all the debris before they can come in and lay down a new foundation. That's what prolotherapy and um, PRP and BMAC and MFAC can do is they can then cause those tendons that are all kind of like all over the place and maybe spaces between them and they're not necessarily connecting to then realign and become a, a more aligned and strong tendon again. And um, if I could add on to that, uh, a big part of this is the protocol. So some people think that they don't need to have a true diagnosis beforehand because the patient has to adhere to the protocol and they're going to heal the right way because they're going to do what they're supposed to do, which maybe they didn't do beforehand. So the protocol, um, same thing like when we talk about um, bones, right? A broken bone, we have to let it heal and then we start increasing the weight bearing so that that bone callus can mature. We do the same thing for a tendon. So we protect it so it can heal and then we start putting pressure on it so that it can mature. And so the, the protocol is very important so that you keep putting the right amount of pressure so that that tendon continues to mature. And then a mature tendon is a stronger tendon. So the answer was yes, I just took a few minutes to say it. <laughs> um, and another question that came up in the chat was, why have the insurance companies been reluctant to reimburse these procedures? Yeah, I alluded to the fact that the evidence-based medicine is lagging. And the, for those of us that do this, and there are people that have, um, are really great about trying to get the research out so much better than me, um, it's tough because there are not any standards for what is, what is considered platelet-rich plasma, what is considered um, the, uh, the right uh, concentration of MSCs in MFAT. So, what people are injecting is not necessarily all the same. So we can't then, and what people are selecting as their criteria is not all the same. So that's my theory why the evidence-based medicine is lagging and insurance companies want sure things. So they don't want to do things that don't have exuberant evidence-based medicine behind it, which is interesting because if you want to get into evidence-based medicine, a lot of the things we do in medicine has not actually been proven. It's just been accepted. So, but since this is new, so there's some interesting, um, actually, people say, you know, the evidence behind steroid injections is like 60%, but we do, that's accepted and insurance pays for it, but it's been accepted for so long. So you're, you're not trying to change the status quo. That is the status quo. But when you're trying to move things along, the burden of proof is higher, which I understand, but it can be frustrating. And, uh, 
in regards to these therapies, uh, prolotherapy, PRP, hyaluronic acid, how long do each of these last? Yeah, so um, for hyaluronic acid, we say about six months. Um, but I have patients that get longer relief. I have patients that get not as long relief. Um, for PRP, prolotherapy, um, BMAC, we're saying, we're saying about 12, uh, 12 months, about a year. Um, but I try to make sure that patients are monitoring their symptoms at about every, so first every two weeks of the first three months and then every three months. Because what happens is patients, you know, you, it, hopefully we get to a point where it's not on your mind all the time. And then by the time it's back on your mind, it's kind of like we missed the boat to like build on the time before. So I always say, you know, just set a reminder on your phone. Every three months, just check and see, how am I feeling today? Um, how, did I, how am I feeling compared to three months ago? Better, worse, the same. If I'm trending down, I need to keep an eye on that because then I might need to see go, doc, go and see Dr. Rubish sooner rather than later so that we don't have to do all the same thing again and we can just kind of keep building on the time before. But it is patient specific. And um, I mentioned this a few times, but sometimes one injection is not enough. Sometimes we get some response, but not enough, and we need to do another one. Um, and that's, again, usually not paid for by insurance. So it's the same cost, double. Um, and that was, uh, that was it. That was all the questions. Oh my gosh, we're starting, we're ending on time. I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For those of you that came, I really appreciate you coming and listening. I hope that this was helpful for you. If you have any feedback of how this could have been more helpful for you, um, I feel really strongly that we need to do what's right for patients. Um, and so if I can do a better job of getting that information out, I would always appreciate that feedback. So if there was some like a big gaping hole of something that you wanted to know or you think I kind of glossed over, I would really appreciate that. Yeah. And, and things that you thought were important and, you know, great. I always take that too. Well, uh, well thank you everyone for, again for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, for more information or if you'd like to make an appointment with uh, one of our physi physicians, please feel free to visit us at rothmanny.com or you can make an appointment with Dr. Rubish or our team at, uh, by calling 888 Six three six seven eight four zero, and just as a reminder to everybody, we'll be sending out the reporting to all registrants within the next couple of days. So please be on the lookout for that email as well. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, everybody, and uh, enjoy your evening.